Welcome to St. Stephen's Lansdowne and one of my favourite views of this marvellous church here in the heart of Lansdowne in Bath. My name's Andrew Avramenko, I'm the, one, the curate for this church and the priest for this community and for you and it's wonderful to welcome you here today. This will be our regular short informal service of readings, sermon and prayer for you to be able to worship and connect with God from wherever life finds you today. Today is the Sunday before Lent. It's a day when we look beyond the testing and the trials and the cross to come to remember the Christ that won out against them all. Before we hear some scripture, let's begin with a prayer for today. Let's pray. Friend of Moses, strength of Elijah, you go with your people and give them your spirit. May the child of your heart transfigure the mortal world that love may know no bounds through Jesus Christ, the beloved one. Our first reading today is taken from the book of Exodus. It starts in chapter 24 at verse 12. It says this, The Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and wait there, and I will give you the tablets of stone, which the law and the commandments, which I have written for their instruction. So Moses set out with his assistant Joshua, and Moses went up into the mountain of God. To the elders he had said, wait here for us until we come to you again, for Aaron and Hur are with you. Whoever has a dispute may go to them. Then Moses went up on the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days. On the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. Moses entered the cloud and went up onto the mountain. Moses was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. And our Gospel reading today carries on that story in many ways. It's the transfiguration of Christ and we're reading the account in Matthew's Gospel, verse, sorry, chapter 17. Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves and with him. He was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun. His clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I'll make you three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud a voice said, This is my Son, the Beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. 
This is the Gospel of the Lord. Amen. I wonder what came to mind when you heard those passages. I know last week that Philip spoke of the things that he often contemplates and mentions in his sermons. Inclusion, Watford Football Club, space, God's love. As I gathered the thoughts from my prayers and sat down to write this message, I wondered whether it would feature the things that I often contemplate. Well, the scripture passages that we've just heard did connect with things that often do mill around my brain. Songs, films and landscapes came bounding into my brainwaves that drew me to the richness of God's blessings waiting to be discovered. The passages brought to mind the matrix, mountains and memories of singing along to I can see clearly now as storm clouds parted over Salisbury Plain which in itself was a little strange because as I wrote this message I was listening to Led Zeppelin and I never can, they never covered Johnny Nash's song. I'd be interested to hear what came into your mind when you heard these readings. Were you captured by the giants of the faith or perhaps the giants of geology? Did you focus on Moses, Elijah, Jesus and the disciples or the mountains on which they stood. In the picture that both passages painted in your mind, did you see the finished image or the brush strokes that made it up? Wherever we go, whatever we do, there is a meaning that waits to be discovered beneath the surface. The surface meaning that we often don't go beyond. But often, as I just said, we don't go beyond there. We don't find our way beneath the surface. Worse still, sometimes we don't even notice what the surface has to tell us. Take the area in which you live, for example. What did you see the last time you travelled through it? Did you see vehicles and road junctions? Did you see places to cross or places to park? Did you notice anything unusual? These aren't trick questions, I'm not trying to catch you out and there's no test coming up. But sometimes things can become so well known or comfortable to us that we stop noticing the beauty or the meaning that they bring to things. We can walk along the streets of Bath, for example, and not notice the hills or the architecture. We can fail to see the gargoyles or the stone carvings, the windows which are painted instead of glazed, or the trees beginning to show springs, signs of spring. We can come into a church like this, sit in the pews or choir stalls in our favourite spot. We can speak or sing the words, listen or give readings, prayers and sermons, and leave untouched and unchanged. When we get used to a place, a routine, a piece of scripture even, we can fail to see the beauty, the blessings and the meanings that lie waiting to be discovered. When our senses are dulled by familiarity, we can miss out on what God is trying to tell us or enrich our lives with. But God is in the business of helping us sharpen our senses to see things anew. In the first of the Matrix films, the main character, Neo, finds out that there is more to life than the desk he works at. Beneath and beyond his monochrome life lies a technicolour life. But he can't see it until he's offered a glimpse of the possibilities beyond the familiar. 
In today's passages, Moses, Peter and others were given a glimpse beyond the God they thought they knew. When God decided to go tell it on the mountain to Moses, he sought to help people see how clearly they could live well. Their previous trauma, having dulled their senses to the presence of God and life in their midst. They wanted a deep connection to God, but had lost their way to it. The Ten Commandments served as a way they could find their way back. When Jesus met Moses and Elijah on the mountain, Peter, James and John were given an audience with the divine to deepen what he had come to know, what they had come to know. Peter had previously come to declare Jesus the Messiah, but there was more for him to know. On the mountain, his knowledge of Jesus was enriched by this divine experience. He wrote about it later, saying how he had been an eyewitness of Jesus' majesty on the holy mountain as Jesus received honour and glory from God the Father, when that voice was conveyed to him by the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. The passage that rings, reminds us of Jesus' baptism, where God spoke similar words. God was revealed in a new way, a way that enriched the lives of Peter, James and John. Moses too was presented with a new and fresh vision and experience of God. All of them found more depth to what they knew. All of them were woke to more possibilities and meanings. All of them were changed. When the clouds parted as Moses carried on, the Ten Commandments off the mountain, when the glory of Jesus' divine nature shone out before Peter on the top of the mountain. Both Moses and Peter could see and know much more clearer than before. To paraphrase Johnny Nash, they could see clearly now the rain had gone. They could see all the obstacles in their way. Gone were the dark clouds that had them blind. It was hopefully going to be a bright, bright, sunshiny day. It's not possible to engage, see and experience with at such depth with everything before us. Just as it was not possible for Moses and Peter to remain in such a heightened spiritual moment. Like both, we have to continue with our everyday living. Like both, we can find our senses dulled once again by familiarity or routine. But like both, we can choose to recall and reflect moments when our senses have been alert to the beauty and blessings of the divine and the created existence among us, or to seek out new ones with the familiar or with the unknown. You would be perfectly reasonable if you're wondering why we have been reminded of the visual and divine brilliance of God on the mountain as the week before we work our way through Lent. After all, Lent is a time when our focus is on the grim realities of Jesus' wilderness temptations and subsequent torture to death on the cross. But there is purpose in the reminding. The reminding of the dazzling divine presence of God before a journey through darkness helps us to know that God can be found in difficult times. The God wins out. But it's more than that. It's a reminder that when we are, whether we are conscious or not of engaging beneath what is before us, God is wanting to break through the familiar to give us new and enriching knowledge and experiences of life. In Lent, we strip away our dependencies and comforts, those things that distract us and mask the truth, and try to see ourselves and the world more clearly. But God also wants us to find our way through the familiar too. Our God of the big occasion is also God of the small tasks, 
God present on the mountain is also present in the mundane. The poet Malcolm Geat sums up all of this in his poem entitled Transfiguration. He says, for that one moment in and out of time, on that one mountain where all moments meet, the daily veil that covers the sublime in darkened glass fell dazzled at his feet. There were no angels full of eyes and wings, just living glory full of truth, truth and grace. The love that dances at the heart of things shone out upon us from a human face. And to that light, the light in us leaped up. We felt it quicken somewhere deep within, a sudden blaze of long extinguished hope trembled and tingled through the tender skin. Nor can this blackened sky, this darkened scar, eclipse that glimpse of how things really are. I pray that God will remove anything in our lives that is eclipsing the fullness of life waiting for us. I pray for a new revelation of God for each one of us. And I pray that God will help us all to engage afresh with what is and what will be before us through prayer, through people and through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Having talked about God helping Peter and Moses to see his love, light and blessings more clearly. Let's now enter into a time of prayer focused on images of Christ. If you'd like to join in with the responses, the responses to Lord in your mercy is hear our prayer. Lord in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let's pray. Lord, you are the light that the darkness can never conquer. Pour your light into the darkness of this world so people, people can see better ways of solving problems. Pour your light into the confusion of our difficulties so that people can see new strategies and possibilities. Pour your light into us, your quarrelsome children, for we ourselves are part of the darkness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, you are the love that casts out fear. Pour out your love into the hearts of all of us who lose our temper and have tempted to torment our children. Pour out your love into the hearts of all who have been abandoned or let down or who vow they will never love again. Pour out your love into the troubled minds of those suffering mental instability and who do not know which voice to obey. Hear, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, you are the peace that the world cannot give. Pour out your peace into the United Nations and its Security Council, that peace may be the goal of their work, despite their disagreements, and peace the method of getting there. Pour out your peace into the soul of this community in which we live, so that people may believe the rumour that you are alive. Pour out your peace into our own hearts as we try to live out our heavenly citizenship in an alien land. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, you are the way that leads to the Father. Show us your way through the problems that face the world at the moment. 
particularly in Ukraine, Turkey, Syria, in Yemen, in Somalia, in places of poverty and war and disaster. Show us your way to those who are seeking a life of meaning and integrity, but who have not yet looked to you. Show us your way that we may, in this church, may know the next steps of our pilgrimage of faith together. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, you are the vine whose branches we are. We pray for those who belong to this part of the vine, but who are present having a difficulty time, through whatever reason, whether it's in sickness of health, body, mind and spirit, whether it's finance, whether it's anxiety, whatever it may be, Lord. We pray for them in silence now. And Lord, we also lift up to those to you we know who are grieving and those who have moved on from this life to the eternal life with you. May you keep us all connected through your eternal love. May you bring peace and may you return the joy of memories of those who have passed on to your eternal kingdom with the knowledge that we too will be reunited with them when the time is right. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And let us collect our prayers together with the prayer that Jesus taught us in whatever language and translation that comes naturally to us. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us in the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Christ, you are the resurrection and the life, and we are your Easter people. Take these prayers and answer them in your own good way, in the power that flows from your risen presence. We ask this in the joy of our faith in you. Amen. Our time here has come to an end. It would be great to hear from you sometime and to meet you either here at St Stephen's or down the road at our sister church St Mary's at Charlton, another beautiful place of tranquillity and serenity to take a moment and collect our thoughts and to be with God. And if you are in the area of Bath, uh, in a couple of weeks' time. We're going to be beginning Lent with a week of 24-7 prayer. It would be great if you could join us for some of that here in St Stephen's. But as we come to say goodbye, let me give you a blessing. May the God of beauty and goodness, in whom is the well of life, Draw you ever closer to your true self in Christ and fill you with the Spirit's passion for grace and kindness and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Goodbye. Take care. See you soon.